Hey, what's up, Young Knack Middle School? Welcome to yet another Sunday sermon. Okay, let's go over a few announcements before we begin. First of all, after service, grab some lunch. Make sure you come back at 1 p.m. for a small group. Secondly, uh, we are still having FNF Friday Night Fellowship. Last week, or this past Friday, we had another FNF. That was great. Hopefully, I'll see you guys again at 7.30 this coming Friday. Uh, thirdly, we still have Bible study on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. Okay, so come out and study Revelation with us if you can. Finally, if you're not getting my email announcements, make sure you let me know so that I can add you to our email list. Okay, cool. All right, with that, let's pray and then we'll begin. Lord God, we ask for your Holy Spirit again to come and open up your word to us. May you work in us. May you speak through the Bible as we meditate on the message that you have prepared for your people. Give us, give us the wisdom to understand and the character to apply what we learn in our walk to you. We thank you for your grace. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. So we've been going through the book of Judges, right? And uh, Israelites haven't been doing too well. And last week we learned about how God used Deborah, who was a woman, and Yael, who was a woman and an, a foreigner, remember she wasn't an Israelite, in order to deliver his people. Right? He used these weak people to be lights of hope in the darkness of the sin that the Israelites were going through. Okay? So even though they were women, even though they were foreigners, people who were traditionally very weak, in that society and culture, God still used them. All right? Cool. Today, we're going to talk about a judge that many of you guys have probably heard about, okay? His name is Gideon, right? Now, before we get into Gideon, let's talk about something real quick, okay? I don't know how many of you guys play sports, but there's this thing in sports called a follow-through, all right? So, I played tennis when I was in high school, all right? So, in tennis, you need to have a good follow through right which is after you start the swing you need to finish really strong otherwise your swing and your stro your strike or your stroke is not going to be as powerful it's not going to be as accurate it's not going to be as effective right it's, it's whether you're serving or whether you are doing a forehand or a backhand doesn't matter you need to have a follow through now that type of follow through is important in many different sports as well whether it's basketball you need to have a follow through after you shoot whether it's baseball where you need to follow through after you swing or in golf you need to follow through after you swing in that as well without a follow through there is very little power and the the effectiveness of the shot goes down okay so if you want to be a consistently good player, that follow-through is extremely important. And sometimes the follow-through is actually even more important than how you start the swing. Why am I talking about follow-through in sports right now? Well, you see, the same is true in our spiritual lives. Your follow-through is a lot more important than how you start. And in the story of Gideon today, we're going to see someone who started off okay, but his follow-through was not good. He eventually loses his way. And because his follow-through was so bad, he actually le leaves Israel in an even worse state than before when he dies. So, who was Gideon? Gideon was the judge right after Deborah. Okay? So, he was, um, he was actually just a farmer, just like any other Israelite. And Israel had sinned again, and so God had punished them. Remember the cycle that we talked about a few weeks ago? Yeah. So, with that same cycle of sin... Okay, God has sent Midian to punish them this time. <clears throat> and in the very beginning of the story, we already know that Gideon is a coward. Okay? First of all, he's hiding from the Midianites in order to uh, thresh his grain, which was traditionally done outside, but he's doing it inside. And secondly, he asked God not once, not twice, but three different times for a sign to make sure that he is the one to go save Israel. Okay? Imagine that an angel came to your house and said, you must save Yongnak Church. And then he says, hey, here's the sign I will show you. And he sets like your uh, front porch on fire and then makes it disappear. Are you going to literally, are you going to tell God after that? Hey God, uh, can I have one more sign just to make really sure? No, it was crazy. He actually came and burned up the offering that Gideon had prepared on the spot by calling down holy fire from heaven. And Gideon 
Gideon had the audacity to say, mm, well, I'm still not sure, God. Could you give me two more signs? Yeah, he was not a, a brave man. He was not a, he was not a, a, a brave uh, warrior, okay? This is, this is uh, very clear from the very beginning of Gideon's story. But anyway, God is still very kind and merciful, so he actually gives Gideon those signs. And Gideon says, okay, fine. You gave me three different signs. I'm just going to go. I'll go and, go and fight. Okay. In fact, even on the battlefield, God gives Gideon another sign because Gideon is still scared to go and fight. On top of all of this, Gideon gets 32,000 men together. And he's like, all right, maybe we have a chance. You know, I'm a farmer. I, I don't really fight, but it's okay. We can do this. God says, no, send a bunch of them home. I only want you to have 300. And he has 300 men left over. And guess what else? He says, don't take swords. Take trumpets. Okay? These are these long horns, right? They take trumpets and take torches and take a bunch of jars. <laughs> it's crazy. So Gideon goes with his 300 men and their trumpets and their torches and their jars. And they beat the Midianites by fighting, by having better weapons, by a intelligent or clever battle strategy. No, they win because they scream and they shout and God makes the Midianites kill each other. <laughs> okay, they didn't even have swords, guys. They had trumpets and torches. It was the power of God that gave them victory. So Gideon is not strong. Gideon is very weak. He's scared all the time, okay? And he has very weak faith. But God uses him because he's weak. Remember what, what I said about Yael, Ajael and Deborah, right? He used them because they were weak, right? He wanted all the nations to see that it was God. It was God who had done, uh, who had gained the victory, who had uh, conquered the people. It, it was not Jael, it was not Deborah, it was not Gideon, it was God. Okay, so up to this part of the story, I'm sure many of you guys have heard this, right? Whether it's in Sunday school or somewhere else, you guys have heard about this story of Gideon. You've heard up to this part. But do you know what happens next? There's more to this story. There's a lot more, actually. Uh, two, three chapters more, actually. Uh, the Israelite army, they actually chase after the Midianite kings. Okay, Remember, they, the Midianites were the ones who were oppressing and who were conquering Israel. So they're chasing the Midianite kings and the rest of their army. But the Israelites get really tired. So they stop at this place, place called Sukkoth. Right? It's a, it's a city, right? and they ask for bread. Gideon says, please give us bread. We have been chasing the Midianite kings. We need some help, right? The, the people of Sukkoth, though, they are like, no, we don't, we don't want any trouble between, between us and Midian or between us and you. So just leave us alone. Just keep moving on. We're, we're not going to give you any bread, okay? We don't know if you're going to actually be able to beat Midian in the first place. So we are not going to give you bread. And so Israel keeps moving. And they come to another city. It's called Penuel, right? And here too, Gideon says, please give us bread. And even at Penuel, they go, we're not sure if you're going to beat Midian or not. Okay? So if we help you and then they end up beating you, well, they're going to come and attack us. So we're just, we're just not going to help. We, we're going to stay out of this. Gideon says, fine. Moves on. Eventually, Israel catches up to Midian. And they actually capture the two kings of Midian. And they slaughtered the rest of the army. What does Gideon do from here? <clears throat> Their mission accomplished? You know, does he just go home? Everything is over and done? Right? God has won the fight. We're done. Nope, this is where everything starts to go downhill. Gideon turns right back around. He goes back to Penuel and Sakath, the two cities that refused to help them. And then he goes and kills all the men who refused to give them bread. Then he goes to the kings of Midian, who are now his prisoners, and because they insult him and he gets offended, he slaughters them mercilessly. Is this okay? Is this okay? Do you guys think that revenge is something that God is pleased with? No. In any, any part of the Bible you read, revenge is not okay. Revenge is not something God is pleased with. This was not okay for Gideon to do. This was not a personal battle. This was a battle in order to rescue God's people. So this was sin. This 
personal revenge that Gideon takes on these people, it was sinful. It was selfish. It gets worse, though. Israel asked Gideon to rule over them now. They say, you're so powerful, you beat Midian for us. Please rule over us. Be our king, basically. Gideon says no, which is the right thing to do. But, but his no it doesn't really mean no. Because after he says no, he goes, give me all the gold, though, from the kings. Give me all their crowns and their jewelry. He takes all of those jewels and gold, and then he melts it down and creates a beautiful golden idol. For some reason. And that's how the rest of Gideon's life plays out. He creates this idol that becomes a snare. As as it says in Judges. It becomes a snare. To him. His family. And the rest of Israel. Let's read today's passage. It's Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8 verses 29 through 35. Judges chapter 8 verses 29 through 35. Let's read it. Jerubabel, that is Gideon, that's his other name, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at uh, Ophrah of the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died... As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bereth their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. <clears throat> what happened? Oh, Gideon. Things were going so well. What happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Gideon had no follow-through. When he accomplished this goal, he got comfortable. He got complacent. He started off okay. You know, he, had, may, he may have had weak faith, but he still obeyed God. And he tried, but he didn't finish well. Israel was left in an even worse position because he didn't finish well. In fact, in chapter 9... Okay, we're not going to read it today, but you can read it on your own time. Chapter 9, his son Abimelech and one of his other sons, they actually end up having a small civil war after their father dies. Yeah, and it's horrible. So, what does the story of Gideon tell us today or teach us today about following through? I think there are two lessons that we can learn from the story of Gideon. Number one. We don't follow through when we get proud of ourselves. We don't follow through when we get proud of ourselves. Remember what I said about the Israelite army? How did they beat the Midianites? Did they they use their swords to like beat them up? Did they use an awesome battle strategy to trick them? No. What happened was they used torches and trumpets and God defeated them for, for Israel. Right? They had 300 men, torches and trumpets. What were they going to do with that against Midian? Nothing. It was God. God won the battle for them. But after winning, Gideon took that battle as his personal success. In fact, it went down so far that his pride actually made him take revenge against people that didn't help him, people who offended him. Personal revenge, which are horrible, cruel and, and hateful things to do. Then he built the golden idol to himself. And eventually his whole family and himself included. As well as all of Israel. Ended up worshipping other gods. What happened? It's very simple. Gideon got proud of his own accomplishments. Gideon got full of himself. Gideon forgot that it was God who gave him success, that it was God who gave him victory. And because he thought that he did it all himself, he ended up having no follow through at all. There was no remembrance of God in anything he did after. How often do we remember that it is God who gives us the mind to do well at school? It is God who gives us the confidence to make good friends. 
and to keep them. It is God who owns your money. Yes, God owns your money, not you. Chances are we are really bad at remembering this stuff. Because when we don't remember God's faithfulness, when we don't remember that God is working in our lives, we forget, we fail to follow through. We forget what's important. We chase after things that don't matter. What about you? What is more important, money or sacrifice? What is more important, fame or humility? What is more important, success or love? All of you know, between those two things, which one God values. So why do we forget? Why do we not live that way in our own lives? It's because we get proud of ourselves. We believe in our own power, our own ability, our own intelligence instead of God's power, instead of God's sovereignty, instead of God being the one who leads everything and helps to make everything work in this world. We forget that God is constantly working in our lives. And so is it a surprise that we forget what God values and we chase after the things that don't matter? No. We forget God, so we forget to follow through, and we have no strength in our faith. And that leads me to the second point. We don't follow through when we get comfortable. One of the most dangerous things to happen to a Christian is to get comfortable. If you've never questioned anything about your faith, if you've never asked a difficult question about God, then chances are your faith is weak. What do I mean? Well, let's bring in sports again. In sports, there's this thing called resistance training. Okay, When I lift weights or when I use strength to push or pull something right, or stretch a muscle, that makes that muscle stronger. The resistance makes your muscle stronger. right? It might hurt a little bit, but that's part of becoming stronger. In your body, there's something called an immune system. When you get sick, when you catch a virus or a bacteria, your immune system fights against that invader and gets stronger. That's part of your immune system getting stronger as well. It might hurt for a little bit, but it makes you stronger. Your mind and your heart are the same. If you don't have doubts, if you don't wrestle with uncomfortable questions, if you are not uncomfortable in your faith sometimes, then your faith gets weak. If you don't push yourself into situations that are uncomfortable because you're scared, then you'll never grow or mature as a Christian. Gideon got comfortable and he forgot about God. He took all that gold, he got really rich, had a bunch of wives, and had 70 sons. Sounds like a great life, right? except he also led Israel down a path of sin and idolatry to other gods. He had a weak faith in the beginning of the story. And instead of the struggles of the battle that made him stronger, no, instead of letting that make his faith stronger, he continued to stay comfortable. He said, being comfortable is better. Being comfortable is easier. So his faith stayed weak. His faith stayed weak. There was no follow through. What about you? Are you questioning? Are you uncomfortable? What are you doing to grow as a Christian or as a believer? Are you developing yourself as a follower of Jesus? Now, a lot of you guys are saying, oh, I read the Bible. I pray. I go to church. Those are easy things. Those are the bare minimum. Those are super easy to do. That's not what I'm talking about here. Although if you want to, sure, I'm sure that can make you uncomfortable as well. What about loving other people? Are you asking difficult questions and really trying to understand what Christianity is by talking to your small group leaders, by talking to me, your pastor, or another pastor, or your parents? 
Are you becoming uncomfortable? Are you having difficult conversations? Are you trying to talk to that person that nobody else wants to talk to? Are you trying to talk to that homeless person and see what's going on in their life and, and really love on them? Are you sacrificing your time and your energy to continue to love and be God's hands and feet to the people around you? Are you doing anything uncomfortable in your life regarding your faith? Because if you're not, you're, you're, you're not growing. You have no follow-through in your faith. You have no strength in your faith. Your faith is inefficient. It's weak. It's dull. Be uncomfortable. Get used to it. When you are uncomfortable, that's where God grows you the most. Let's pray. Lord, may you help us be less comfortable with our faith. Shake us up. Remind us that our comfortable way of life is not what you have planned for us as your disciples. Remind us, God, that you are the one who sustains us and gives us life. May we remember that our successes and accomplishments belong to you and not ourselves. In all of the things, spiritual things in our lives, may we have the follow-through required to finish strong. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And all right, guys, stay tuned for worship, and I will see you right after at our 1 p.m. small groups.
gracious tempest and the sea, your love is like a storm. This tide of mercy rain Let it flood my heart again Surround me like an ocean Crashing over me and surging like a raging sea, immerse me in the wonder of your love. A downpour of unending grace consuming all my reckless ways, my sin submerged your love has shaped my soul. Your love is like a storm. Your love is crushing over me and surging like a raging sea. Immerse me in the wonder of your love. A downpour of unending grace consuming all my reckless ways. My sin submerged. Your love has saved my soul. Your love is like a storm. Oh, your love is like a storm.